All right, what's up, Internet? It's Monday, August 19th, 11.50 p.m. I am now recording this for the second time. I recorded a banger for you, and the audio was not coming into the system, so let's try this again. Uh, today, I want to talk about local first is not just a software problem. It's a people problem, and I'm going to take you through a little journey here. So first, I'm going to explain what local first is, the idea of local first software. Um, it, it's an interesting paradigm in software development. I'm going to talk about the difference between local first and kind of centralized software or server uh, kind of cloud based software. And then I want to talk a little bit about why I think local first software is about more than just software, right? It's about people. It's about protecting your privacy. It's about data. It's about building relationships that mirror the way we interact in the real world rather than what most technology does now, which is abstract the value of most of our relationships into a centralized hub for purposes like training artificial intelligence, selling advertising, et cetera. Let's get into it. <laughs> All right, so first things first, what is local first? Um, local first is the concept. It's been around in software for a while. Um, I'll share a, a, a link, this company Ink and Switch. Uh, has a paper that's well written about what local first software is. It's been around for a while, but the concept is essentially that uh, the data lives on your device, right? So it's local to you. And how that, you know, it's different than centralized servers or centralized software or most of the software we use is that typically when you interact with uh, a mobile app, a web app, a website, uh, you know, anything digitally, the data that you put into the system, sure, it may be stored somewhat locally. There may be a copy of it that's stored locally, but it's not typically stored in a format that you can access or in a place you can access. And there's also a copy of it that's served on some kind of central server, right? Some kind of database that's in the cloud, right? We've all heard this term in the cloud. Uh, Amazon Web Services is one of the biggest cloud provider. Google has their own cloud. Like there's all these clouds that exist out there. And most software is reliant on these centralized servers to manage the exchange of data between you and other people. This is how software becomes collaborative. This is how you can access software on one device and another device and another computer, and you can just kind of log in and access this software. And so the idea of local first software is that you recreate some of what we get from traditional software stack, some of this server-based software, this hub and spoke based software, you can think about server or centralized software as hub and spoke type thing where the server's in the middle and you, you know, these spokes come off and then we're all these little hubs and we all interact through these centralized servers and our data passes through those servers. And the idea of local first software is that this, that just doesn't happen, right? The data is localized to you and the more modern platforms in the local first space then allow you to share data by creating direct peer to peer connections between other users in the network, thereby creating a network that, again, doesn't rely on any type of server. It relies on these peer groups or these peer computers to kind of talk to each other to share that data. It's very popular concept in the world of uh, uh, cryptography, in the world of decentralized computation, in the world of uh, privacy advocates. And there's a couple reasons why, because you own the data, the data stored in formats that are accessible to you, uh, it's private by default, the systems work offline, and then they sync online. And um, there's no place in the middle for someone to kind of intercept your data to, you know, steal your ideas to, uh, you know, modify your behavior to lock you into a platform and say, hey, now we're holding your information hostage. You know, like, there's just different incentives. And it's an interesting paradigm that's evolving in the world of software development because we're starting to see that much of the software that exists out there in the real world is becoming corporate spyware, right? Or has become corporate spyware. We've all heard this big data concept and data is the new oil and information is the new currency online. And I think that that has led to this glut of big tech platforms whose primary purpose is to harness and kind of monetize the value of these large networks. And they become powerful because they are large networks. This is why Facebook is 
more powerful than uh, a small social network because lots of people are on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or TikTok or whatever the network is, right? They have something called the network effect. And the network effect comes from having lots of users on the platform, sharing lots of data on the platform. And then they use the data, those insights from you know, the social graph from who you interact with, the type of data you update, the type of data you uh, engage with, the, the content you spend time with, like all of those become signals for them to advertise to you, for them to influence your behavior, for them to curate your algorithm to get you to spend more time inside of their system. And the more time you spend inside of their system, the more opportunities they have to then influence the outcome of your time on that platform. Again, whether that's to sell you products, whether that's to influence your behavior or whether that's just to, you know, uh, feed the machine, right? And, you know, if you think about software in general, most of it comes from places like Silicon Valley or, you know, London, New York, Austin, like these big tech hubs. And they have very different ideas for what we should all be doing than you might have in your local community. Right. And so for a long time, it just hasn't made sense to build software at small scale. Right. In order to make money selling software, building software, you had to build software that scaled. Right. And it had to have millions of users. And you see this even now with like, you know, these AI platforms scrambling to see who's going to get the first hundred million users or the first billion users or whatever it is, because as they create that momentum and as they get all those users onto the platform, it gives them more data. It gives them more uh, information about what you're doing to then either sell that off to advertisers or kind of lock you into their platform while they build out whatever features. And so the incentives around centralized software, large software systems versus what you might do in your small group or your small network or in your hometown or in your community are very different. And this is what I think is interesting about the local first software paradigm because what local first aims to do is better mimic the exchanges that we have as humans that allow us to build stable societies and by that i mean high trust environments right if i am talking with a small group of friends i will be more candid with them i will be more trusting of them uh, for a couple of reasons one i know they're not going to betray my trust if i say something that's you know, politically insensitive, or if I'm talking shit about someone, or if I reveal something deeply personal about myself, I know that they're not going to take that and use it against me, right? And this is what makes them my friend. This is what makes them trustworthy. Whereas if I'm on Zoom, or if I'm on Google, or if I'm on some of these platforms, and I'm sharing information with them, I have no idea what they're going to do with this. They may be using it to train their artificial intelligence. They may be selling it to the government to report on my behavior. They may be you know, doing any number of things that are not high trust. And so again, the incentives, the incentives are completely different across these types of systems. And in the real world, like in your local world, in your community of people that you interact with in physical space, right? There's a difference how we interact digitally and in the physical space. You just wouldn't trust people who betrayed you like that for long, right? You may say something to someone one time, some offhanded comment, uh, reveal a little too much personally, maybe say something about somebody else. And then you find out that they went and told that person. And, you know, like you would feel betrayed by that. And you would say, okay, well, I'm just not going to tell that person anything more. Uh, that's important because I can't trust them. And you would kind of remove them from your communications infrastructure, right? And your physical relationships. This is why we have trustworthy relationships. This is why personalized networks, uh, are so much different than these digital networks. But in software, you can't control those things, right? Like you don't have the ability to tell Google not to track you or to tell, you know, Zoom not to listen to your Zoom calls or, you know, like whatever may be happening inside of any of these systems is beyond your control. You have no say as to what they do with your data. You know, when you sign on to a new platform, they just give you this big legal contract up front. And if you want to use the platform, you click agree. You almost never read it and you just move on. And you don't think, you know, almost none of us ever really think about what's happening behind the scenes that all of these organizations are selling or leveraging that data for one reason or another. And so this means that most of large tech has become corporate spyware in one way or another. 
Uh, and the other thing that happens is that you completely lose control of that data. Let's say the company goes out of business or they change their model or they decide to raise their prices or you know whatever number of other things could happen that leave you locked away from your data. And these are things that this local first movement tries to solve, tries to remedy by, again, bringing that data ownership closer down to the like to the ground level. Um, and for the first time ever, we're in a phase where like, if you look at what's happened in the no code space, and kind of in this visual software development space that I've been in for, you know, the last five, six years, uh, and that's been kind of exploding over the last handful of years. The reason it's becoming so popular is because software development is hard, right? And building tooling is very difficult. And so these no code platforms abstract some of that complexity and make it more approachable for folks like myself or folks like you to go and build things that, you know, like you might not have been able to build before because it was too complex to build or because you needed to hire uh, some software developer to build this. And now you can, you know, type into a, a a, an AI prompt and have it spit out some code, or you can go to Zapier or, or Make or Integra, you know, uh, formerly Integramat, or some of these automation platforms and kind of wire up some of these different systems to accomplish specific goals. And it starts to make sense for you on a smaller scale to build software. Again, for a long time, software needed to scale at a high level to be profitable. We're entering an era now where that's not necessarily the case. And so what happens if you and your family or you and your small business or you and your group of friends wants to build something that's just for you that nobody else has access to except for your group of friends except for the people that you invite into the system just like you might into a small peer group and this is the paradigm that i think is different right local first again going back to the premise it's not just a software problem it's a people problem and if we look at what it takes to build a stable, solid society, right? If we go back to, you know, some of those principles, uh, what's outlined in the Bill of Rights, you know, and what's outlined as a fundamental right of us as humans, almost no technology respects those things, right? If you think about like the original Declaration of Independence, and I've talked about this before, we essentially, you know, said no taxation without representation. We're going to establish a new system of, of laws and, and, and order and this new structure for society that or that respects the individual rights, right? The, the rights of an individual inside of this system. And this is what I think Local First aspires to do in a technological realm, because in a digital space, we're essentially recreating these feudal systems. Right, like we're, we're all familiar, I'm not gonna break down what a feudal system is, but the idea is essentially that you don't own shit, right? The people at the top own the land, they own the rights to your labor, you get a small portion of that in the ability to live, maybe you get us to keep a small bit of the, 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 the food you farm or the, 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 the fruits of your labor in one way or another, you get a tiny sliver of that. Whereas if you flip the script, right, and you say, no, we own all of the fruits of our labor, and we will put a small portion of that at play in order to like benefit the greater society. That's kind of the paradigm of the American Revolution, right? The, the modern West, if you will. Um, that was one of the paradigms. But in the digital world, we're kind of building and like regressing into a digital feudal system where none of us own anything. We don't have any rights. We don't have right to privacy. We don't have right to ownership, right? You can't own these things. You can't say what you want on these platforms because the platforms might shut you down or they might feed the data to the government or, you know, they might just cut you off or restrict you from having access to the platform. And so, you know, we kind of live in these technological systems that we're so reliant on, but we're held hostage by them. And the only people that extract value from these digital systems are the large networks themselves. And so what they've done is build systems that allow you to kind of connect with folks that you trust or that you engage with in the real world, social networks. But then they've abstracted the value of that relationship and they've taken parts of your communication and the way you engage and they've kind of used that to build a revenue stream rather than letting the value of that money or that monetization opportunity or just the trust that comes with that actually benefit the local communities, the small communities, the people who are using the platforms. And I think this is an important paradigm. If we're gonna have a successful digital world that's built around this technology, 
you have to have systems that mimic high trust societies. And to do that, you need something like what we're looking at in this local first software paradigm, which again goes back to respecting the rights of people, not necessarily the rights of the platform, right? That put people first instead of profits or instead of uh, a, a, an abstraction on your privacy, right? And so I think this is what is interesting about this whole new paradigm that's evolving in this in the software space. If you're not tuned into it, uh, you should definitely um, take a look at what's happening in the in the local first space. Uh, you'll hear me talking quite a bit more about this because I'm working with some companies in that space right now. And this has been something that's on my mind for a while. So I'm actually excited to be working with organizations that are building the infrastructure for the next layer of the internet, right? Because I think there's no way we're giving up our devices, right? I'm not gonna give up my laptop. I'm not gonna give up my phone. We're not gonna stop communicating with each other. Like we're not going back as it relates to how we expect these tools to like benefit us and serve us as a society. But we are going backwards in the fundamental ideas for how these systems serve us. And right now they don't serve us, we serve them. And this is what I mean about like a digital feudal system. And for us to move forward for like the next phase of tech to not be completely removed from the value of humanity, it needs to be focused on people. It needs to be focused on the local community. It needs to be focused on the people who are building it and using it and putting their brains into these systems, right? And so you have to protect folks' privacy, just like we have the Fourth Amendment, right? You have to protect people's rights to be able to speak, just like you have the Fifth First Amendment, right? Um, I don't know that there's a Second Amendment for the, for the Digital Bill of Rights, but you know there are surrogates where you should be able to protect your right to do these things and create these networks that, again, allow you to maintain the value and to build high trust connections inside of them that are not being perverted by some VC-driven tech company that's just trying to extract as much value as they can from the network so that they can sell off their profits or that they can sell off the, the, the platform at the end of the day to the highest bidder. Um, and so that's, I don't know. Um, I'm going to leave it there, I think. That's, that's the premise of Local First and why I think this is bigger than just software, right? The software is an enabling factor. It is the vehicle by which this you know, paradigm shift is happening, but the paradigm shift is something we've seen before. We've seen it over and over again. Well, not that many times, but it's what we saw with the American Revolution, where again, essentially the people said, fuck you, we're doing this our way. We're gonna build the rules and we're gonna build the system. And I'm not saying that was a perfect system, but it was better than the system they broke away from. And that's the same thing we have to think about with tech here. The local first technology is not perfect yet. It's not a perfect system. It's going to be a while before it becomes perfect, but it promises to offer us a better way forward, right? Because we all love this digital technology. It's necessary for us to communicate and to be able to do the things we want to do in order to grow and scale the way we want to grow and scale our societies. But it has to be focused on humanity and the people who are building the systems, not necessarily the platforms that are extracting the value from that system. And so anyway... Those are my thoughts on why I think Local First is more than just a software problem, why I think it's a people problem. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. I'd be eager to hear from you if I'm uh, you know, totally out of my mind here or if this is something that uh, you think is important. Are you active in the Local First space? What are you seeing uh, uh, around any of this? I'd be interested to um, just hear your thoughts on that. And another thing I'm gonna do, um, just as a, a separate aside here is, um, I think I'm going to pick one day of the week and just start doing these things live and having some conversations about this stuff. I know I mentioned it before, but um, with the new gig and with some of the new constraints on my time, it's just getting more and more difficult to just, you know, fire these off. And so that's why I'm kind of doing this at midnight right now. But um, I'd love to have these discussions publicly and, you know, invite some of you all to share your thoughts with us as we do this. So Anyway, if you made it this far in the episode, I appreciate you listening. Leave your thoughts in the comments, either on Spotify or YouTube or Twitter, wherever you're watching this. And um, yeah, stay tuned. We got a lot more coming in this realm. I'm working on, um, uh, let's see, what's the network state, you know? So this idea of can you even have, you know, uh, sovereignty on inside of a digital realm? 
or does it have to be localized? And so I'm just going to start thinking about these paradigms, drawing parallels through kind of historical context and lessons we've already learned. Uh, I think history is repeating itself, but it's repeating itself in a way that we don't recognize because it's happening through digital channels. And, you know, there's almost never been a time where, you know, great powers have essentially enslaved folks for the benefit of a small minority of people. And we just don't realize that that's happening now because it's happening in digital sense. And we are all 100% slaves to these devices. Uh, whether that's because we're tied up into some social algorithm that's just keeping us, you know, looking at this machine or for one of the reasons I outlined in this document, but we have to start figuring out ways to kind of draw the same protections that we have in the real world inside of these digital spaces. And I think that local first software is a first step to some of that, but it's going to require a lot more along the way. And it's going to require not just the software, but the people who believe in the software and the people who are, um, you know, active in policy issues, in building communities, in driving change, in numbers of different ways to get involved also. And a lot of that's just going to come from building community and talking and having conversations like this. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. Thank you for uh, listening up to this point. I appreciate you. Um, yeah, catch you in the next episode. Bye, everyone.